All right, cool. <laughs> We're going to turn to Acts 24 today. I think we might get through this book, guys. <clears throat> it's been a long one, but man, it's been good. It's been good for my soul. Um, just a, a brief little recap of where we are right now. Um, we've been going through the book of Acts. We have seen the early church. We've seen how God's Holy Spirit has been poured out on the church for those that were in one accord, that were, were just seeking the will of God, for just saying, God, what would you have us do? What would you have next for our lives? And we see one of the men recently that God poured out his spirit on and said, I'm sending you out. Uh, I'm going to make you a church planter, a, a disciple maker, and I'm going to send you to governors and kings. Uh, we see this man, Paul, who was recently, after 20 years on the missions field, he's been called back to Jerusalem, where he faced an angry mob, and then an even angrier Sanhedrin, and he was under threat from 40 Jewish assassins, and then he got an escort out of the city by 470 Roman soldiers. That's what I call a very eventful trip. So from a mob to a Sanhedrin, now Paul is going to stand before a governor, but he must wait until his accusers can arrive. So it takes five days, chapter 24, verse 1. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus, and they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude, but in order not to weary you further. I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect and even tried to desecrate the temple, so we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to learn the truth about all these charges we were bringing against him. The other Jews joined in the accusation, asserting that these things were true. <clears throat> to really... Break that down right there. Um, the Jews hired this slick lawyer named Tertullus. They came to him, and they were like, we need, we need you to uh, be the prosecution against Paul. Um, and then the, the lawyer would have asked, it's like, okay, cool, what's your evidence? And then the Jewish counsel would have been like, there isn't any. I would have been like, cool, cool, you're paying me how much money? All right, I'll do it. And so... He goes up there, and, and literally what you just saw was their whole case. Was, the man did this thing. And then according to the law, you then have to bring witnesses. There are no witnesses because this thing did not happen. What they're accusing him of doing, of desecrating the temple, and that's their one big gripe, it did not happen. And so, I love what Tertullus does here. He's flinging accusations, he's flattering the governor as much as he can, which by the way, Felix was known as being one of the most corrupt governors the province of Judea ever had. And so he's just flattering him with a bunch of lies, saying how great he is. Uh, and then um, he just says, what evidence? Um, he doesn't say anything about evidence. All he says is, and now if you'll just, if you'll just, uh, cross-examine the guy. He's just going to give it all up. He's going to tell you why he's guilty and uh, go Paul. Yeah, get him on the stand. Let's hear what he has to say. They got no witnesses. It's literally like they just did their opening remarks and then they're like, and that's all we have and now the defense. All Paul has to do is say nothing. Is that what Paul's been known for recently? No, no. Because before an angry mob, he's like, I think I'm going to share my testimony. Before the Sanhedrin, oh man, I stand in all good conscience before God today. I mean, the, the guy will just stand up and he'll just like any opportunity to preach. This is what Jesus has said is going to happen. 
You're going to stand before governors and kings. He's making the way for you. He's clearing the path. He's even giving you an armed escort to get to this place. So Paul is walking in fulfillment of Scripture, the words of Jesus in Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. This path Paul has been on takes him into the heart of the culture that day. Paul isn't here to be found innocent or guilty. Not to Paul. He's here to preach the gospel. The reason you came into this place today is to be reminded in the presence of the body of Christ that God sent his son to die on a cross and raised him from the dead as the perfect sacrifice for our sins. We need that reminder every day. We need to give that reminder to someone every day. You came to worship, to love God, to love people. And if you didn't, well, I... Hope you make him Lord of your life today before you leave this place to lay yourself down, to surrender to him. So now we watch as Paul offers the gospel to governors and kings over the course of the next few chapters. And instead of being flustered, I love this, guys. Have you ever been around a a famous person or a semi-famous person, whoever it is? I've, I've been around some people that have, have been on TV or I've been around senators, I've been around some, some high-ranking officials. Guys, you just act different. Or I find myself acting different. I, I try to be the same all the time, but every once in a while I'll get in front of someone that I'm like, oh, you're a higher-up person. You're suddenly like, I'm shy. Like that kind of thing. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're like, ah! You know, I don't know, however you react. But there's just a little a change in your demeanor sometimes. Paul is now in front of a governor that can sentence him to death, can uh, release him. I mean, he's in charge of of a whole province, and, and now he's in front of him. And instead of getting flustered, um, Luke 11, 11, the words of Jesus. I believe Paul is relying on this. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. When have you ever been in front of someone and you you know you should say something and you don't know what to say? Mm. Um, How many of you ever have have uh, been in a moment where you were vexed about, like, oh man, I, I should have said this, or I should have done that. If I could go back and do that again. Um, I, I think so many times we don't just surrender our hearts and minds to the Holy Spirit and just trust Luke 11 to be true right there. When I'm before someone, when you're before someone, just let the gospel shine through. Let love shine through. Paul does not have a fancy lawyer with a bag of tricks. He's representing himself. And what he has is the Holy Spirit and the gospel. Verse 10. When the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you've been a judge over this nation, so I gladly make my defense. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city, and they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets, and I have the same hope in God as these men themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. 
After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Or these who are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin, unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. I just want to stop right there. I didn't have this in my notes. I want to say that um, there's a lot of people that I believe are acquainted with the way. That's a really good way of saying it. Um, They're acquainted, um, but as we're going to see here, Felix doesn't know Jesus. He's acquainted with Scripture. He's acquainted with, um, you know, with this man Jesus uh, that's that's really raised up quite a fuss. Um, But he does not know him. That's going to be real important here soon. Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. So even though with the evidence presented, um, even though Felix has sufficient cause to just release Paul because there's no evidence or witnesses against him. Felix doesn't. Felix is trying to please the Jews here, but can't really rule against Paul. So he just keeps him under guard, a prisoner, but one that is free to roam about the grounds while they wait for Lysias. Remember the Lysias was the Roman commander who made sure Paul got out of Jerusalem alive. Uh, They're waiting for him to come and give testimony. And then God really opens the door for Paul. Verse 24. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, That's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. You think that bribe's ever going to come? I mean, Paul's just like, you keep asking me to come back? I'm just going to keep preaching the gospel. This is great. Preaching to a governor over and over and over again. I'm going to help you know Jesus. He wants a bribe. What he's going to get is a greater gift than he could ever imagine. To know about this God that loves him. But verse 27, when two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. So Paul would have shared his testimony to Felix and his wife, as we've seen Paul do so many other times, his road to Damascus. Paul, again, was a a very um, good scholar of the Bible. He knew the word of God. And what he chose to, it says, speak on, Three things over and over again. It says, Paul spoke of righteousness to Felix. What it means to be in right standing with God. Felix would have been afraid of verses like Isaiah 33, 15, because it says he was. It says he he lived in fear of these things that Paul brought him, because I believe as the gospel was shared, as verses were quoted to him, Felix's flesh was like, I don't like that. That makes me uncomfortable. Verses like Isaiah 33, 15, those who walk righteously and speak what is right, who reject gain from extortion and keep their hands from accepting bribes, who stop their ears against plots of murder and shut their eyes against contemplating evil. They are the ones who will dwell on the heights, whose refuge will be the mountain fortress. Their bread will be supplied and water will not fail them. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty. 
and view a land that stretches afar. It's like a man exactly opposite of who Felix is. That would have hit Felix right in the center. Felix is a governor who was known for doing what he wanted when he wanted, for accepting bribes, for being very corrupt. He pursued the desires of the flesh. And Paul would also focus on self-control. Paul says in Titus 2.11, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. And Felix, Felix couldn't like hearing stuff like that about self-control, about rejecting worldly passions, about rejecting uh, wickedness and corruption. And a letter from Paul will circulate in Rome, one that we can read today that says in Romans 12, 12, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And man, is that a scripture for today. God loves me just the way I am. Okay, he loves you and died for you while you were still sinners. But do not then conform to the pattern of this world. You're a new creation. The old has passed away and all things have become new. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We think so so often in our flesh, we want to have that I'm, I'm a God unto myself mentality like we had in the garden, where we just say, well, God loves me and I can do whatever I want. And God is saying, no, I want to use you. I want to see you holy. I want to see you set apart unto me and do his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And so you have to lay down worldly passions. You have to reject the things that would so easily beset us and hold fast to him. Felix wouldn't have liked any of this. Felix knows about the way. He's acquainted with the way. But he doesn't like this talk of righteousness. His flesh fears talk of being transformed. He really wouldn't like the third thing that Paul focuses on when he talks about judgment. That's the thing we... I don't preach a lot of hellfire and brimstone messages. Um, it's not a thing we like to dwell on so often. But 2 Corinthians 5, words, uh, words right there, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. And a letter from the disciple John will make the round soon in the early church, Revelation 20, 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, the earth and the heavens, fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Felix was, Felix was taught these things. Righteousness, self-control, and judgment in the days to come. Paul would have shared his testimony letting Felix know, I, I was under judgment. 
I was under a weighty judgment and I felt like I was doing what God wanted me to do and I was so wrong. And I was kicking against the goads as we spent a, a good long time talking about. And I was actually going against the things of God. And I was under that judgment and then I met Jesus. And he called me out. And Paul became a servant of Christ. And Felix's reaction when presented with these things that we just read right there in Acts 24 was no. An emphatic no. I don't want that. You can leave. Have you ever just been so passionate about the things of God? And you've shared your heart, you've shared your testimony, you've, you've shared scripture, and you've just been excited. And you watch as, as the person or persons that you're sharing it to, the light just goes out in their eyes, and they're just like, nah, no, that's not for me. I've seen it happen time and time again. Um, there's one specific time that always sticks out with me. I had this colleague at, at work when I was working at the truck stop, and and uh, this person was going through some stuff, and I, I just shared my testimony, and I shared the things of God, and I shared just how good God is, and even though I was in a place, I felt very much in the wilderness in my life right now, God was faithful, and God was there, and God was real, and he wants to know me, and he wants to know her, and he, and he wants us to, to make him Lord of our lives. And I watched when I talked about that specifically, about surrendering to him, the light in her eyes just, nope, I don't want that. Because, man, we don't want to surrender, do we? We want to we wanna be a God unto ourselves. We want to call the shots. We want to do it our way. We want to do what we want, when we want. Felix had this same problem. But Felix keeps bringing Paul back. And for two years, Felix is expecting a bribe. And Paul keeps bringing him the gospel. Until one day, Felix doesn't come back. And he's replaced by another governor named Festus. But Felix leaves Paul a light in this dark place. So now we meet Festus in chapter 5, verse 1. Acts 25, verse 1. Thank you. <laughs> it's good looking out. Gonna have roots. Uh, youth group always has my spotters over there. Um, three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and the Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. They requested Festus as a favor to them to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem, for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. Festus answered, Paul is being held at Caesarea, and I myself am going there soon. Let some of your leaders come with me, and if the man has done anything wrong, they can press charges against him there. So this is interesting, and as I began to study this, um, I began to see this chapter in a different light. Paul has been just hanging out in Caesarea, in one of the governor's houses. He's not in a dungeon cell He's in like a nice place right now, uh, under house arrest. He's not allowed to leave, but he's allowed to walk around. He's got some freedoms. Uh, his meals are covered. His living arrangements are, are uh, nice. And this is as close to a sabbatical that Paul has had for over 20 years. Don't get me wrong. He's under guard. He's being held there but I still see it as a sabbatical nonetheless, a time of rest for Paul. Um, I'm going to 
I'm going to just share a bit of, of uh, time I had in youth ministry that is going to sound stupid in comparison to this because I was not under house arrest, okay? But I did have this moment when I was a youth pastor down in Tulsa. I'd been serving for many years as a youth pastor for about 10 years. And my senior pastor sat me down. Uh, a good, awesome, godly man. I love this man to this day. And he sat me down and he said, um, Josh, uh, we love you, um, but we're going to have you step down as youth pastor. And we're not firing you as associate pastor. You're still an associate pastor because you do all these other things. So we're still going to, your salary's not going to change. None of that's going to change, but we're just taking you out of this area of ministry and letting you do all these other things. And guys, my heart was crushed. My heart was for young people. I'd been doing it, uh, really I'd been doing youth ministry since 16. And I was 28 at the time. And I went home and I went to my wife. I'm just like, everything is stupid. And um, why, why did this happen? And I'm blaming myself. And, um, and my wife is like, what if we see this for the blessing that it is instead of for, for the negative that we think it is? And I'm like, well, that just doesn't make any sense. And I would look back at this a year later and be like, wow. God was in control the whole time. Some context for what was happening in my life right at that time. This happened about 10 days before my wife would give birth to our second child, Lorelai. And so I was about to be a father of two children. Anybody that has ever had two children will tell you. Two children? (laughs) Very different than having just one child. Now, as soon as you get to three children, eh, it's all the same. Um, but one child versus two, wow. And they were 18 months apart, Witt and Lorelai were 18 months. And so we were about to add this whole other um, workload into our lives. And because I was now suddenly freed up from youth ministry, I found that when this happened, it was like, oh, this is... We can do this. I'm around now. Youth ministry, there's a fun thing where I was, uh, I had two small groups that I did during the week, a Wednesday night youth group, a Sunday morning church service, uh, and then I would try to, to go to extracurricular things. I was out and about all the time. And now suddenly I was like, I have a family. I remember you guys. You're nice. Yay. Uh, it was great. And for nine months, I just focused on these other things that the church wanted me to focus on. Our needs were met, and I felt like I had rest. (coughs) I missed youth ministry, don't get me wrong, but I just, I chose to be faithful, and I chose to trust, and I chose to lean on God. And in nine months, nine months would go by, And they would approach me and they would say, we would like you to be youth pastor again. And I was like, all right. And so so, uh, God brought me back around. But during a time that I really, really, really needed it, I got it just a period of rest. I think Paul's experiencing that here for two years He's in this place where his opposition, the people that want him dead, can't get to him. He's under guard. He's under protection. Um, He doesn't have people that he's not going into towns where they're trying to drag him out and beat him, where he's going to be whipped, where he's going to face an unruly mob. For two years, he's just in this, this mansion place that the governor is at when he's in Caesarea, and he's just chilling. Two years. It's about to get so much worse for Paul. 
But man, for two years, he's just here in Caesarea. And guys, sometimes, to make a point here, sometimes what we think is a bad thing, what we think is a negative, when we, when we don't always understand, it's like, man, that, that layoff or that time when I had to move or that time when I, I thought I was going to do this and then something else happened, maybe see it as a time that God is trying to show you something to, to test you, to refine you, or maybe even just get you to rest because he's preparing you for something else. Sometimes God's provision, the way he has us rest so he can prepare our hearts and minds for the next task, looks different than how we think it should. So often God's will for our life looks different than how we think it should look. For Paul, the, the second these two years are up and Festus is now in charge, the Jewish leaders who want him killed are right there with Festus saying, hey, you got this guy, Paul, who we'd like to see unalived. Could you help us with that? Let him come back to Jerusalem. And they say right there in the text um, that they're planning. If he gets transferred, they want to kill him before he even stands trial. Thankfully, Festus says no. Another example of God using ungodly people to fulfill God's purpose and plan for Paul's life by keeping him protected in Caesarea. Just in the last few chapters we've read, we've seen God use a Roman centurion, the Roman commander Lysias, and now Festus. These men did not follow God, but God swayed their hearts to help lead and guide Paul to where God would have him go. Verse 6. After spending eight or ten days with them, Festus went down to Caesarea. The next day he convened the court and ordered that Paul be brought before him. When Paul came in, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him. They brought many serious charges against them, against him, but they could not prove them. Then Paul made his defense. I have done nothing wrong against the Jewish law or against the temple or against Caesar. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, sounds like Felix again, said to Paul, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? So that last verse, because of what we know the Jews are planning, that last verse is more like asking Paul, would you like to go back to Jerusalem and die along the way? Paul knows anyway, though, he's not going back to Jerusalem. That's not the path God has for him. He said so. So to go backwards would be folly. It's, and I'll just testify to this. It's why my wife and I didn't stay in Tulsa. And I was just sharing this with Laura just earlier this week. For a season in Tulsa, for 15 years, we felt the hand of God in our lives moving in uh, both through education at ORU, through associate pastoring, a life connection. And we had favor and we knew what to do. And we experienced hard times and we experienced um, some setbacks. But through it all, we were faithful and we watched just God just open door after door after door after door. And we worked hard and we saw amazing things happen. And then God said, time to move. And we had a brief three-month period of, no. <laughs> but in that three-month period, we saw doors begin to shut. Where doors have been open one after another. Like literally, it was in July God was like, move. And by October, we were like, I uh, really think we need to move. Like just the confirmation that God gave us was amazing. And so we obeyed the will of God. And we moved up here to Iowa. And it felt like when we got here, every door, for a year, it felt like every door was shut. We were like, God, I'm confused. And it was so cool when we went back down to Tulsa a year later and every door, I mean every door that had been opened, was now firmly shut. 
and we went back up to Iowa a week later and we saw, we were able to look and be like, wait, look, look at all these open doors. This is amazing. And just year after year after year, door after door after door, I saw a couple open just this week that amaze me. Um, I do. I, I know that Paul knows, like, this is the way forward. It's not back to Jerusalem. That's a closed door. It's to go forward. It's to go to Rome. That's where he knows he's headed. And during the way, um, guys, during the way of, of my journey, just from, from Tulsa back to here, this is my hometown, um, so back to here, I just want to say that when we initially got here, I was so discouraged because I did. I thought people should just get out of the way and let me do ministry. God needed to work on my heart. God needed to break me down and add a healthy dose of humility for a season. And even though there were some hard times, again, I found myself in a season of rest where I became strengthened in my faith and I learned to trust God better and I learned how to love him more. So whether Paul knows his life would be in danger on the road to Jerusalem if he went back or just he knows that, no, he's like, that's the wrong direction, he should be going. He lets Festus know that he's not going back to Jerusalem, something he can do as is his legal right in a case as a Roman citizen. Verse 10, Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have not done any wrong to the Jews as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. This is so cool. Um, it wasn't really uh, until I got into King Agrippa's heritage here that I understood why. Um, King Agrippa, also known as Herod Agrippa. Um, this is a king that the Romans have allowed to be in charge to help rule Israel. His great-grandfather was the Herod who had all the children under the age of two killed in Bethlehem, trying to kill Jesus. His grandfather was the Herod who killed John the Baptist. This Herod Agrippa knows about the Jewish customs and he knows about this Jesus person that people are still talking about all these years later and doing so like he's alive and well and risen again. And now, one of Jesus' servants, as Paul calls himself in, himself in so many letters, a servant of Christ, is now standing before this king whose family has been an enemy of Jesus. To tell this man the gospel. Because, here's the wild thing. Enemy or no, Jesus died for Agrippa. Mm. And he would see him offered a seat at the table. We don't get to decide who's worthy, guys. We are called to, to go into all the world. All the world. Verse 14. Since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. He said, There is a man here whom Felix left as a prisoner. When I went to Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him and asked that he be condemned. I told them that it is not the Roman custom to hand over anyone before they face their accusers and have had an opportunity to defend themselves against the charges. When they came here with me, I did not delay the case, but convened the court the next day and ordered the man to be brought in. 
When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I had expected. Instead, they had some points of dispute with him about their own religion and about a dead man named Jesus who Paul claimed was alive. Oh, amen. I was at a loss how to investigate such matters. So I asked if he would be willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial there on these charges. But when Paul made his appeal to be held over for the emperor's decision, I ordered him held until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself. He replied, tomorrow you will hear him. And that's where we'll pick up next week. In the meantime, I want to remind you that this faith we have is about a dead man named Jesus who is very much alive. The world is at a loss to this. They respond like Festus. is like, I don't get it. I don't understand. And it's our job to proclaim it and to say, Look, I know him. I've met him. He's alive. I've encountered him. I've experienced him. He has forever changed my life. And he wants you to know him. If you are in a season of rest, I pray you make the most of it. Not by kicking back and and just filling your, your life with hobbies and and stuff. Those are fun. Those are nice. It's good to have things that you enjoy and do to relax. But I pray you also lean in with your relationship with God. Allow him to fully equip you for the next part of the journey. Remember, though, that while Paul was on those grounds in Caesarea, he still preached the gospel. He still proclaimed the kingdom. At no point um, do we ever just say, it's like, well, <clears throat> not going to worry about what the Bible says for the next couple months. Not going to, you know, I'm going to let some opportunities go by where I just don't share what God has done for me. No, let me just tell you, my grandpa, oh, my grandpa, Paul Gerard, that man never wasted an opportunity. Never, every single time I met him, the thing that was on his heart and mind was just to say, but God is good, and I love him, and he loves you, and you need to be walking in his ways. When my grandpa had a series of strokes over 10 years that just took his body and just robbed him of all mobility, I'd show up, and through one side of his mouth, he would say, God is good. And the last thing he would ever say to me was, Joshua, I love you, and I'm praying for you. The gospel doesn't take a day off. There's no time where we we can't miss out on an opportunity to tell someone about the goodness of God, to share our testimony, to declare the kingdom, and to offer a chance for redemption and salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. Go and make disciples of all people today. Go into all the world. And remember the words of Paul in Galatians 2.20 that I, I believe is a prayer for all of us that we can stand behind and point to ourselves and say, yeah, that's me too, Paul. I have been crucified with Christ And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. May the Lord bless you. That's what he wants. He wants to bless you because he's good, because he loves you. That's why his mercies are new every morning. May he bless you and may he keep you. May you feel close to your heavenly father. May he shine his face on you and be gracious to you. 
May he turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.